I think that we have, let me see, I see Rogan, I see Meg, I see Lynn and Andrea, fantastic. And I actually have sunlight now, so, you know. Nice. I'm far more visible than I was in my earlier presentation. And the storm came here, so now it's pouring. Oh, it's northward bound, okay. <laughs> Well, we're, let's go ahead and get started. I was eating peanut butter, so it took the last minute I had to like actually be able to speak. Uh, welcome all to this last session of the day. Thank you again to Evergreen Indiana Library Consortium for providing the Zoom platform for this session and to Equinox Open Library Initiative for sponsoring closed captioning for the 2020 Evergreen International Online Conference. All the sessions and roundtables are being recorded. And if you've been in these sessions all afternoon, you've heard me say this now four, time, that four times, they will be made available following the conclusion of the conference. Please take a moment to acquaint yourself with the webinar tools if you haven't already. While your uh, attendee microphones are muted, you are encouraged to use the chat box as well as the Q&A feature. And if you do want to use your microphone, you can raise your hand at at the appropriate time and um, speak using your microphone. If you'd like to send a message to everyone in the room, please make sure to select all panelists and attendees from the drop down menu. Join me in welcoming Lynn Floyd, Meg Straup, Andrea Bunce Nyman, and Rogan Hamby. Lynn is the supervisor for the MIS department at the Indiana State Library. Meg is the SC Lens cataloging coordinator at the South Carolina State Library. Andrea is development project manager for the Equinox Open Library Initiative and Rogan Hamby is data and project analyst for Equinox. And I'm going to stop sharing this and whoever is taking over is gonna go ahead and take over. I think that's me. I'm slide driver. So let's go ahead and do that. All right. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Cool. All right. Well, welcome to um, our, our talk about how to talk about open source value. Um, we're all going to share uh, individually some talking points in around various subject areas um, that we thought were important when talking about open source value and then we're going to ask you all uh, for for what you think so let's jump right in all right um i got the first slide um First question, how do you qualify the value of development community versus investing in a proprietary developer? Um, first, let's qualify the value of a development community. Um, to me, really, you really cannot. Um, there's so much that goes into a development community that you can't, you, you, there's, there's a lot of value you, you just can't get qualify. Um, a development community is so much more than just the development. Like I was saying, it's feedback from every aspect of the project community, everything from the line staff to the developers. It's a two-way two feedback conversation that's constantly going on. It's not just a one-way like you would get with a lot of proprietary developers. Um, but if you talk about the proprietary development system, you're talking about a development system that's Take, really take suggestions. And then only a few individuals at different institutions are those suggestions actually taken from. Um, I'm working with one um, development with another project and there's only like two of us that in the entire project uh, in Indiana that can actually make suggestions on that development where with the development community, anybody can make development. Um, suggestions um, and then it usually has to work through a development process and working with several different proprietary systems through the years they're all different every single last one I'm sorted and so they your suggestions go off in the ethers and you never see them 
Um, so, but some are a little more open than others. Um, one, one system I'm working with, the, the process is a little more open, which is great. I'm glad to see that. Um, but to compare the value, the qualifying, the value and, and comparing of the two, it's down to what you want the development to, how you want the development to progress. Um, or are you able to spend on development? Um, how much do you want your input? How much do you want to do input into the development of the of the project? Um, yeah, Evergreen, I love being able to focus all that um, to, to, to help develop it the way I want the project to go. Um, do you want totally to be ha totally hands off on the experience? Do you would want to really not worry about what's new out there? Um, then I would say a proprietary system is more for you. But if you're worried about what is going on and with this particular software, um, open source is probably more, and an open source development community is probably more what you're looking for. Um, like I said, if you want a large input and you want to see what's new, what's available, what's coming down the pipe, um, then that open source community is great. Um, if you're unsure of which way you want to go and you do not have the technical skills or the ability to gain those skills, that's another question you have to think about. So that's, I mean, how do you qualify the value of the, of the of the, of the development community versus a priority, priority developer, it's all in what you want your experience to be. Next slide. All right, this is Meg Strout coming at you from South Carolina. The Georgia storm has now moved to South Carolina, so if there's any sound interference, I apologize, that's what's going on. And I just want to really echo Lynn's last point that you're going to, you need to find what you want and what works for your community and be very aware of that, of what is a good fit. So that leads us to how you communicating the sustainability of an open source project if you decide open source is what you want. And I think part, a really important part of answering that question actually lies in the question itself, an open source project. A project is a process, it's an ongoing thing, it's a thing that's living. It's not a static product that is a wrap software box on the shelf at Best Buy and you grab it and you go. This is not a thing with a shelf life like that. When you were talking about sustainability, you, I, I really associate the word process with the project, with putting more into it. You want this to be sustainable. People using this product want it to be sustainable. It's, our, it's to our benefit. Um, we want to nurture what works for us, the software that is so beneficial to our own goals and needs. So it's an ongoing investment and going back to the quantifying question that Lynn was speaking of, the investment is people. The investment is perhaps money to pay to, for development. Um, but it's also knowing that your open source non-vendor is not going to cash out at any point. Uh, there's, there's, it's sustainable in that um, there's no cashing out. There, you're not waiting for the vendor to say we're done with this. Instead, you, um, you have the goal of keeping this alive and well. If you were at an ALA presentation last year, free kittens versus free beer and open source is a free kitten, um, you want to keep your free kitten alive, well, and healthy. And that's the kind of commitment people have to open source. And I don't think people really realize that, is that we feel very strongly about this. And we're going to keep, our commitment runs much deeper than just making sure things work. And that's a different kind of sustainability um, than we might have with a regular proprietary software product. We, um, so how do you, how does sustainability work out? You have community conversations. We're having one right now. Um, you have development. You have a group of people 
just widely dispersed with shared concerns, um, shared values, shared library values, and we'll get to that later. It's all very transparent. You can see where the project began. You can fold all the way back to Georgia in the mid late 2000s and see that there, there are strong roots to this evergreen tree, sorry. Um, but you, that gives you a sense of planning out where, where it's going. You, you know where it came from. You know this ongoing, once again, process. I'm going to say this word a lot. And our shared goal for this process is to create the best product slash project for now, but also for the future. We're continually future-proofing because we know that this is something we want to sustain. We're going to keep this kitten alive. Um, so I think we've seen some really, really good recent examples of that with Evergreen because of the COVID situation. Um, I hate to capitalize on that to argue for open source and sustainability, but we saw the community react really quickly. We saw it be very agile. That's the kind of sustainability that's happening in the moment. We're not saying it's going to happen maybe, maybe three months down the road. It's just this very quick, very quick ongoing process, conversation. Um, and speaking as a cataloger, I do see those conversations about far future things when we're worrying about bib frame, when we are worrying about what to do with RDA fixed fields. These concerns are already in people's mind and people are not saying, if we're still using Evergreen, they're saying, okay, we're going to be using Evergreen and how is Evergreen going to make this work? We know who we're working with. How do we make this sustainable in the long term? And that's, that's a really deep and important commitment. So future-proofing is a priority and that is tied directly to sustainability. And just to finish, when you sign a contract with a vendor for a proprietary product, you've got that symbolic line at the bottom you sign. It's a finish line, it's a cutoff line, it's a deadline. Um, at some point, somebody's gonna draw a line under the project and it's no longer sustainable because they've cut ties. For open source, it's sustainable because the finish line keeps moving, it keeps going forward, it keeps going forward, it keeps getting better, it keeps getting better. The goals keep rolling out. Um, so we are not in the open source community going to um, reinvent the wheel. If we have something good, we have something that knows, we know that works and we want to make it better. It's a constant goal, better, better, better. So rather than reinventing the wheel, we are just going to keep getting new tires. And I will hand it off to whoever's next. Maybe I should unmute myself before I start talking. All right. Um, I have the next question, which is, what is the value of the software itself? And there's a lot of ways to talk about value. Um, a lot of, you know, intrinsic value and sort of soft, softer statements of value that, that I think we're all touching on in this presentation. I was curious about cash value um, because a lot of times, you know, we're competing against proprietary vendors and they probably have a pretty clear idea of the cash value of their own software. And determining the cash value of software can be tricky, uh, even in a proprietary system. So even more so in an open source system. Uh, some community members are paid to work on code for their job. So that's a pretty one-to-one -one value calculation. Um, some are paid not specifically for open source work, but are able to do community work on paid time. Um, others uh, who contribute to the community, quite a few, contribute on their, on their own time. And these are not exclusive categories. They're, one person might fill a couple different roles in those categories. So I was looking for a way that you can translate labor costs into, into software value. Um, we obviously can't really easily determine the various hourly rates of all the individuals who contributed to Evergreen, but there are ways to estimate um, value of software based on lines of code, which is, which is a data point we do know. Um, one of the most well-known is known as, as Kokomo, spelled with C as though C-O-C-O-M-O, -O, which stands for Constructive Cost Model, and this is based on the total lines of code for a project. 
And this is certainly not a perfect model, but in a big project like this one, I think it at least gives an interesting ballpark. Um, so Evergreen and OpenSurf together have roughly 2.4 million lines of code. That sounds like a lot, but that's actually not huge. It's for an enterprise class system, that's relatively lean. For example, um, if you're driving a newer car, uh, that software in your car might contain 100 million lines of code. So not so Evergreen's very efficient in that sense. Um, the Kokomo model takes this count of lines of code and a few different kinds of multipliers based on project complexity, um, cost per person month value, um, which is based on a full-time rate of 156 hours per person per month. Um, and if we take a relatively low hourly rate for a software developer of $20 an hour and then round that person month cost down to $3,000 per month, the Kokomo model tells us that Evergreen's code base is worth $46 million, which I was kind of staggered to read um, when, I, when I ran this through the, the calculator. Obviously, this has been spread out over um, going on 15 years of work, but it's still pretty astonishing when you think that anybody can go download this code totally for free. And this is only one measure, one metric of measuring cost, and as I noted, an imperfect one. But um, it gives us an interesting data point to talk about the put an actual number on the value of the community's work over 15 years of participation. So I thought that was really pretty cool. And of course, bear in mind that the cost of the software itself is only only a portion of the cost of a software solution. So for libraries, you're um, not just paying for software, you're paying for other costs like hosting and training and support. And another point of open source value here is that it's much easier to have an itemized understanding of what you're paying for. Um, you, you aren't just writing a blank check, you know, for X number to your, to your support vendor. You are seeing what you're getting for support, what you're getting for hosting, training, it's all broken out. And you can have um, any combination of solutions. You can have a fully vendor supported solution. Equinox hosts many people in that realm. Um, you can have just a vendor on call just in case, you know, you accidentally blow up your database and you want to have them walk that back for you. You can contract independently for development or training without being hosted by anybody. And you can also choose from among uh, community vendors. So there's a lot of value um, to that, to being able to find a solution that fits your specific organization's needs. And I'm going to pass it on to the next slide. And hopefully I am unmuted and not following Andrea's example. Um, <laughs> Not that I have ever forgotten to unmute myself. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I'm going to answer the question, hopefully in a manner that doesn't take the entire rest of the time period. Is there a quantifiable value to ownership and agency? We can talk about this a very long time because like Andrea's question, this is about value. This is about actual monetary value associated with things. And once upon a time in my life, I was in a position where I had lots of public libraries that would ask me, well, what's the real cost of this open source thing? I keep hearing people say it's free. And of course, you know, we're used to talking about, well, it's free in this way, but not free in that way. And like Andrea talked about, anybody can go and download it, but there are gonna be real costs associated with running it, whether you do it yourself or you hire somebody like Equinox or whatever. Um, but what about the other costs or value you get? And it's very easy for us to say as an open source community, because we have an intuitive sense that this is true, that there is value to ownership and there's value to agency. And by agency, I hear kind of mean the power of self-determination. Um, but can we associate an actual monetary line item value to this? Can we say that libraries save money or generate value? And I think so. And to sort of kick this off, I'm going to share a story. I know everybody's probably dreading this moment. Oh my God, a panelist is going to share a story. Um, but I'll, I'll keep it simple. 
back when I was a systems librarian at a public library that was running a proprietary system. It was a much beloved system and we've been running it a very long time, but it was no longer being supported and we needed to move on to something next generation. And we were looking at Evergreen as well as other options. And during the course of this, we were talking to a lot of other people in our user community who were also sharing our same software. And frankly, we were kind of trying to see what they were doing and what, you know, pitfalls they fell into so as to hopefully not duplicate them. And there was one library we talked to a lot who ended up doing two migrations in two years. That's right. They migrated from what we were on to a whole new system found clauses to terminate their contract within the same year, and then began a process to a whole other vendor to finish within a year. Their staff by the end of this had PTSD. Um, it, it was horrible, as you can only imagine. It, and there were lots of costs here. It was chaos from a public service standpoint. And we can take all the hassles they had with holds, with circulations, with reprinting materials for the public, for the time staff had to re-explain things. And we can associate costs with those things. Staff hourly costs, printing costs, all those things. Uh, the time of their uh, employees and probably the medical mental leave they needed. Um, <laughs> I think they had at least one cataloger they had to, you know, do retirement payout for because they left in the middle of this. <laughs> Meg's making faces because she can imagine. Um, yeah, so that's a, that, that's a story of where something went wrong with migration choices, but how does that relate to open source? Well, during this process, I was comparing it to what my library was doing which was we downloaded a copy of Evergreen, I put it on a test server, and I did a sample migration of data. And I had circulation staff come through, catalogers, uh, reference staff, and they played with it and told me what they liked and didn't like about it. Meanwhile, the other library that had this really negative experience didn't get to see what their stuff looked like on the new software until they had a contract signed. That is agency. That is a power to make a determination. And ironically, even if we had not gone with Evergreen, we did, we would have derived value from it because we were able to make an informed choice. And these are the sorts of choices you can make ongoing constantly with Evergreen. Um, you don't, if you run a proprietary ILS, guess when you get to try out a new version of a software most of the time when you're live on it. Compare that to most of the open source world where it is very much the norm to have a test server for months, if not significantly longer, on a version you're gonna to upgrade to before you upgrade. These are all examples of agency. Um, now let's jump to the, I'm going to use another example of a scenario. Let's say you want to change hosting providers. Let's say I, you're with a hosting provider. They've helped you out with your evergreen install for the time you've been around. And it's a great person, but, you know, they've been running a one-man shop and they're about to retire. This happened actually fairly early in Evergreen's existence. There was a person who was pretty much a sole proprietor shop and he supported several evergreen installs. and he happened to retire. Well, I know that everybody that he was working with has gone on to other evergreen hosters, uh, several to Equinox, I believe, although that was before my time at Equinox. And it was just a matter of taking their database and transferring it to us and setting them back up. That's ownership. No having to terminate a contract and transfer it into a new form somewhere else no losing of data, no dramatic retraining of staff. That is a value of ownership. Take all those costs you incur in a migration when a business shuts down, and this goes back to the longevity question, and just zero them out. 
So that's my short version <laughs> of what is the value of agency and ownership. The, the fact that every decision you make, you can assign a dollar value to and staff time or consequences. So, and I'm tempted to talk about development, but I don't know, Andrea, that might be a rabbit hole to fall into when we talk about the value of uh, agency and development. What do you think? I mean, it's a rabbit hole near and dear to my heart. So if you're asking me to stop you from that, I'm not <laughs> sure. You should maybe ask Meg or Lynn to throw a flag on that one. <laughs> well, they had an opportunity and they didn't. So very quickly. <laughs> um, really, when you talk about ownership and agency, you also have to talk about the ownership and agency, the ownership of the development. I think that's fair. Uh, development is, and, and I do want to talk about it briefly, it, it, it does have the potential to become a rabbit hole, which I'll try to avoid. One of the values of open source is the potential for long-term long longevity. Uh, when the library I was at first migrated to Evergreen, one of our selling points for other libraries when we were starting a consortia was we said, we know this will last at least 10 years. You'll be able to be on this platform at least 10 years before you have to worry about migrating again. And that particular platform, SC Lens, is now well past 10 years. Um, but once the project hits month. a certain, hmm? 11 last month. 11 last month. Um, and many more to come. Oh, yeah. So when you get a large base of usership, and lots of eyes on something, it develops inertia, momentum. It kind of has a life of its own. And that's good because it doesn't become stagnant because as we all know, user needs change over time, both for patrons and staff. And software can kind of age out of usefulness or at least become less attractive if it doesn't gain new features. Uh, I'll point to, for example, curbside pickup as an excellent example of somewhere where open source can be very responsive to current needs. Um, and you want to be able to direct that. I mean, I remember working with proprietary vendors who were nice people. I mean, I don't have anything against them. Uh, and fortunately, I knew them well enough that they would say, I know your library could really use this feature, but we just don't see a profit in adding it. I mean, that was the nature of their organization to analyze what made the most profit for the business. However, in the world of Evergreen, um, even if your organization can't sponsor the development or have the people to code it yourselves, you still have the opportunity to open dialogues with a wider community and potentially lay a groundwork for it happening. You can still log on to something like Launchpad and see development happening that could impact you and provide feedback. And these are things that everybody can do regardless of their resource level. And yeah, I think you can assign value to those things. And in the specific case of curbside, what we were able to do is I tossed it out to a list of people who had expressed interest and said, hey, we're gonna do this. It would be you know, great to have a sponsor for this. And then Pales stepped up and agreed to sponsor that work. Um, but there was a whole there's a whole list of community people that are going to be involved in, in testing that and, you know, uh, committing that code. And, uh, you know, while the impetus of it came from Equinox, the implementation of it is always going to be a community thing in an open, the implementation yeah. of any feature is always going to be a community thing in an open source project. Both and the, is, oh, I'm sorry. This is, no, this is the feature, particular feature I was alluding to. I spoke of process and agility and quickness of response. The type of development that you can expect to see in open source that really unfolded in real time, real time conversations in front of us. Development is a thing you can see happening. And the value is there because the value was articulated by the people who were using Evergreen. Yeah. And Everybody who uses Evergreen can provide feedback. And there is a sort of uh, a feedback circuit that happens where developers do not want to do work that is not useful because it's not gonna get maintained. It's, it's not going to end up being feasible long-term to develop things that aren't really useful. So 
everybody, even the smallest library with no tech people, with no money to put towards development, can still go on, read a bug feature uh, request on Launchpad and say, you know, what would really make that useful is if it is if fill in the blank. And that has an impact. And if that impact means two less clicks every time you have to do a booking, and you're, you use booking a lot in your library, start doing the math, and you can assign a quantifiable value. And it's absolutely quantifiable in cataloging and processing, where right. Small and circulation make a world of difference. And if you want to talk to a group of people who can articulate what you want, welcome to cataloging. We know what we <laughs> want and we can tell you, but the development community can make it happen. And we will tell you, or you will tell us, I should say. <laughs> yes, we will. Sorry. Not really. <laughs> no apologies needed. Um, so just in summation, is there a quantifiable value? The answer is yes. Uh, it, and I guess the real thing I want to add to that is it's not even that hard to figure out. You kind of have to learn how at how to look at it, but once you learn how to do that, it's easy and it's a real dollar value you can assign to your operations. That's it. There's a dog alert there and Rogan's camera for those of you who didn't catch that. That was my great Pyrenees, <laughs> Harry. He is, he likes to make the rounds and make sure that everybody is safe. Right. So, Good job, Harry. Keep up the good work. <laughs> so this next slide um, is a little bit kind of a round robin where we're all gonna tell you what we think. Um, since I clicked the slide, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what I think first. Um, but this is something, uh, is there a value you can assign to open source and how it aligns with library values? And this is something that has been near and dear to my heart um, for a very long time. Before, um, before I came to work at Equinox, I worked at an Evergreen library for 11 years. We weren't an Evergreen library for that whole time, but we were an Evergreen library for eight of those years. So I, um, and at the time we were the first public library in the state of Maryland to migrate to an open source ILS. I actually think still the only one that ever did. Um, and so this was something that my former colleague Karen Collier and I talked about a lot in presentations that we gave to other libraries throughout the state, which is um, how, how open source uh, aligns with library values. Um, the whole idea of librarians being information providers wanting to share information and share uh, resources is just so resonant with open source where you're sharing code, you're sharing documentation, you're sharing ideas. Um, I also think a lot about a more recent quote from um, my colleague at Equinox, Mike Rylander, who's one of the original developers of Equinox. And he said this in the context of a panel at the ALA conference last year. Was that just last year that it was in DC? Good Lord. Um, <laughs> It was just last year, wasn't it? Uh, he was in a panel of open source executives and he said something to the effect of, because uh, open source conversations happen well in the open, development conversations happen in the open, you assume uh, good faith on behalf of all participants. And I think that's really resonant with the idea of open information and libraries and librarians. Uh, I'll pick it up from there. Um, I'm thinking back to my reference days a little bit, and I don't know how many people in the chat here have ever worked as a reference librarian, but uh, th there is a sort of camaraderie that happens at a busy reference desk um, <laughs> uh, where you get used to passing things back and forth. You'll take a patron, you'll triage them, you'll realize that this other staff member knows more about that particular subject than you and you pass them off and at the same time, they pass something else off to you. And there is a good faith, to use Andrea's via Mike's turn of phrase, 
that everybody is working towards a common goal to help each other out. And we see that in the open source world a lot, uh, certainly in the evergreen community, where people are working together towards common goals. Uh, and you see some of the communication in Launchpad and IRC. We see it a lot at the conferences and the Hackaway, where people pull on each other. Hey, you know, person X, I know you've worked on this stuff in the past. Can you show me this? Can I get you to put your eyes on this problem? That sort of thing. And, you know, this is, this is a library value that's not anywhere encoded in, say, an a ALA set of ethics or... Uh, principles about open information, all of which are very noble. Um, but if I think if you've been a frontline working librarian, there is a sort of culture that mirrors the open source world in an important way there. But maybe that's just me. <laughs> no, I would absolutely echo that. I've worked both frontline and in technical services. And when I moved to technical services, one of the thing I, things I left behind me as a legacy at the front desk were specific pieces of paper written out, tell me what you need, and each one had a subject. So at the end of the month, I would get a stack of papers with book requests, with things that weren't working, and that was the information that was conveyed directly to me. The people at the front desk had written it down at the time it happened, and it ended up in my hands for me to deal with. So we have this constant communication going on, and Maybe I can make it happen with the ILS. Maybe I can make it happen with the mark record by adjusting a search term. Um, sorry for not using controlled vocabulary, but at least people can find things. And that's something I keep coming back to with the librarianship values is, at the end of the day, people want to find things. They want to know where the thing is and they want to leave the library with it. The right software enables you to do that. And if it's not working, in the um, open source community. Part of the value is, as you can say, this is not working. This is not working for the community we serve. We value serving our community and we value serving them the best way we can. And then you open up that conversation to um, develop the community at large. And hopefully at the end of the day, you return the value to the, your county of 1,000 people or your county of 50,000 people. It's just this, the value spreads. It one person at the front desk says, "This this thing is very visual. I have, I have visual visual impairment. I'm having trouble reading this." And then it just it snowballs. And I think that's just a terrific value that one voice can have such a great effect on um, a process and product. And to go back to the value question, um, in that county of a thousand people. I think you can assign a value because that person who's engaging with the wider community by responding on a, say, a launch pad ticket to say, you know, this works for us or this doesn't work for us, um, is now part of that value in that Kokomo calculated uh, $45 million of code. You know, they didn't write the code themselves, but not all the value of that code is the, in the writing of it. It's also in the bug testing, the specifications, and all those other things. And that person has now contributed to that value. And we're not competing to see who contributes the most value. The large consortium is not winning the value contest because there is no value contest. Our values are fundamental library values, not having the highest sales rank at the end of the month. Well, tagging on to what everybody's saying, the core value of the librarianship, according to ALA, and I just looked this up so I didn't know what it was, where among them are access, confidentiality, privacy, democracy, diversity, education and lifelong learning, intellectual freedom, preservation, the public good, professionalism, service, social responsibility, and sustainability. Open source does all that. Access. Access to everything from what we were talking about in the keynote speak. Um, disability access. We are now looking at that. 
if it wasn't open source, then there'd be a whole nother conversation there. Confidentiality, confidentiality, privacy. Those are ingrained in a way, especially evergreen, is wrote and developed. Democracy. There is a huge democracy among um, open source projects. Even other open source projects that I'm, I help with, there's a huge democracy in open source and diversity. And the next one is diversity. If you look at this panel, there's three women and a guy. Most panels, most open source and development projects, there's more men out there than there are women. So we actually bring in a huge diverse population of people to support this, this project. Education and lifeline learning. Every day I learn something new. Every day, every one of us learns something new, whether it's through working with this open source project or working with other open source projects. We're all learning something new. And I know people who've worked with Evergreen who've moved on to other greater jobs because of what they've learned working with Evergreen. Um, intellectual freedom, that's a, a given preservation. I mean, a lot of historical value of what, well, what a library has done is actually preserved in the way the database was designed. So you get that whole preservation of data. Um, the fact that we do have the historical circulations and things like that, you get the historical data. And at any one time, you can call up what your circulations was in 2009 when you first started or whenever you first started. Um, if you don't age your circulations. Right. <laughs> Well, even Which if I you actually age, encourage people to do, but <laughs> that's just even me. if you age your circulations, there are ways you can call up those circulations numbers. Um, the public good is it cost effective? Is it? I mean, I've gone from really bad, really really bad ILSs to, to Evergreen, and the public good way outweighs professionalism. There's a lot of professionalism, but I mean, with open source projects. Um, I just attended a conference last month, um, All Things Open. Um, and I got to talk about Evergreen at, at several sessions and, and what the Evergreen open source community is doing. Um, service. I mean, this is a service that we provide for our patrons. They have the ability probably to do things now, especially with some older ILSs and things like that, that they wouldn't have been able to do before. Social responsibility. Are we socially responsible for A, a the money, how our staff time? With an open um, ILS system or an open source system, yes, we are that social responsibility. And then always the last thing is sustainability. Sustainability is very big with, within libraries. Is this project sustainable? Um, I just ran through uh, a group of um, LSTA grants, um, determine which one. And one of the things that we had to look at was sustainability of the projects. Was the project sustainable? Um, with the open source community, especially like every, yes, it is sustainable. It's been here for a while now. Um, it's not going away. So you've got to look at those things. And there is value that you can assign to a lot of open source projects that do assign, align with the, 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 our true core library values. I think Ruth made a point in chat um, related to the values Lynn was discussing that open source promotes skills building for those people participating in it. And that speaks to the library values that Lynn was discussing, as well as it speaks to value and possibly assigning a price tag. Are you going to have to pay to train people to learn to do new things? Are they going to do it on their own time? It's an, it can be an incentive for, employee, uh, for employees to, who want to take on new projects and learn new things. Um, I think that, that the whole question of just, just promoting skills building is a, a whole other can of worms. And 
it's really another discussion of, of how it plays into open source, but it's really a vital part of the agility, again, the commitment to learning, and the process of moving forward and what do we need to move this forward? What do we, as librarians, what skills do we need to serve our population? And how are we going to deploy these skills to best serve these people we value? Awesome. And I think um, with calling out Ruth's uh, question in the chat segues us nicely to our last section here, which is um, ask us ask us questions. What do you what do you think um, about open source value, how that can be communicated, how that can be shared, and what do you think about it in the context of um, of the other conference sessions that you've attended so far today and yesterday. Um, so you can use the Zoom uh, Q&A or the chat, either one. We can, we can watch both. I have eyes on both, but one of the things that, that I have been thinking about as you guys have been talking is actually just looking at the panel and talking about the value. I'm looking at two people who when I started in with Evergreen, um, and I could talk about my story, but it's not about that. Um, Rogan and Andrea both were in public libraries when I, when I started um, doing various things, growing their skills in the, this open source community and, and their place within. And now they are working um, still in a public way, but for a, a private organization. Um, and that is because they had the opportunity to grow those, those skills and to um, progress just in their lives. And Evergreen, as an open source project, was, was a big part of that, not only the, the software, but also then the relationships that formed in the community and, and all those things. And I think that not talking about the community, well, and I don't want to frame it that way. For me, the community has been as important as the software. The software is awesome and open source does speak to the values. But it's all that, about the people. But it is all about the people. I mean, and, and we, we developed the, this language of camaraderie and that also then feeds back into the development of the software. Mm -hmm. It becomes mm -hmm. this loop where we can have these conversations and we can be then responsive to the needs of the libraries and the organizations and the people and it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I will forever be grateful to my former director at Kent County um, for entrusting to mid 20 somethings with zero system administration experience when we were like, we think we should migrate to Evergreen. He's like, that sounds great. And, you know, there might be, um, there might maybe a different person would have been more circumspect about that um, before handing that project off to myself and Karen Collier, but obviously in, in the long run, everything was fine. Um, but I will, I will forever be grateful to him for sort of shrugging and letting us, letting us run with that um, and, and letting us pursue that because of all the relationships that we've built and all the things that we have learned. Um, and Karen, who many of you probably know, uh, is no longer really part of the Evergreen community, but she made a, a big impact when she was, she was one of the first um, I think the first actually head of DIG, the Dis Documentation Interest Group. Um, she actually has some lines of code in the code base as well. And um, those are all things that, skills that she acquired um, as part of the Evergreen community. Yeah. I, I, I think that that kind of speaks though to, to this unique thing is that you don't necessarily have to be the smartest kid in the class. No, but Karen probably was. But, but you just do saying. need to be an enthusiastic learner. And, and so that the open source community really lends itself to those enthusiastic learners, those people that want to get in there and get the, the dirt under their fingernails or, or whatever it is, um, because the skills can be, those can be developed, but the enthusiasm mm -hmm. needs to be there in order for that to happen. Right. 
Lynn, were you going to say something? No. Oh, okay. Sorry, I, I thought I never had the opportunity before I started working with Evergreen to find out that a mark record wasn't just a mark record that I saw on the screen and filled in all the blanks. I had never been able to tear off the lid and find out you can just get your yeah. hands in, get really dirty. And that's a truly wonderful feeling. And I, I would have trouble going back to just sitting in front of a monitor now and just following the rules, honestly. It's, it's freeing. I spent about 10 years with Evergreen and then went into a, um, a proprietary software setting for 14 months. And, and some odd days I could figure them out and probably should, but I don't want to remember <laughs> that much. It was absolutely agonizing because I was so used to the conversations you could have about um, this aspect of the software or what is the timetable for this development feature or where do we talk about this? Where's the forum for it? Mm -hmm. It didn't it exist. It, it mean, I mean, there were people that were either grinding their teeth whenever I spoke or they were rolling their eyes and laughing. The sum total being the exact same thing, absolutely no resolution for the things that were in my mind. I want you to know that I'm laughing from a place of love, and I'm, I and I'm, no, I and I'm really glad that you came back to the Evergreen. Community. I mean, people may still grind their teeth and roll their eyes when I talk, but it's it's, it's different outcomes, though. <laughs> I work with both currently work with a both a open source system and a proprietary system, and I remember a conversation we had recently about um, emergency close dates, and how Evergreen uses emergency close dates and everything like that. And um, how we were using them during, I mean, when everything was closing down for the pandemic. And the 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 people who were, were dealing with the proprietary system, they were like, we never even thought of it. Never even thought about doing anything like this. Right. And it's been part of the system we're using for a while now. Um, so, and so sometimes it does, it, things that do get developed in open source systems do bleed over into proprietary systems, especially when you have people who have to work in both worlds. We have about eight more minutes. So if there are more questions, Sharon did bring up this comment. If you didn't see it, she was so tired of hearing that's going to cost $5,000 when we were on a different system. Yeah, I hear you. That's a different module. You'll have to wait. Are you ready to sign a new contract? Yeah. Ah! And um, I know this is primarily an evergreen audience, but uh, one of the nice things about open source is it also informs between open source projects. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, there's also an open source ILS called Koha, and I noticed the other day that they've opened up a bug ticket saying, hey, Evergreen's doing this curbside thing. Let's look <laughs> at what they're doing. It might be useful to develop the same features here. Um, and that's not a one-way street. I mean, Evergreen has looked and taken inspiration from things Koha has done as well. Right. Uh, but that, and, and there are certainly people who actually work in both communities, uh, I'm myself being one of them. So I think that's a great thing, and it improves the value of both communities being able to The nice to thing learn. about the license, too, is that yeah. you can say, <laughs> hey, I was looking at this thing, and it does this. How about we think about doing this thing, rather than saying, oh, I might have saw, seen that in passing and then had this independent thought so as not to, like, steal your intellectual property. Mm -hmm. so My modern it. tradition of code reuse is, you know. Right. Much easier to support when everyone's under the, the GPL. That's exactly right. No. That's actually a caveat I meant to give. I might be quoting something somebody has already said in the previous conversation. I'm sorry, but nobody, I'm very confident, nobody is going to email me and say, hey, that was my idea, give it back. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because the conversation is so open. When we swap ideas around, this right. whole presentation came out of a previous conversation. Mm -hmm. So it's joint ownership. Time for the last slide, you guys. Yep. I believe All right. it is. So this is this is one for the road for y'all to think about. Um, that is again like this this whole presentation is very much like 
I'm all in my feels about it, you guys. Um, is, can you assign a value to the transparency and trust that can c accumulate in an open source community? So that is our philosophical question for you to ponder in these 20 minutes between now and the happy hour if you're joining the happy hour. So. So I'm going to answer it for me right this minute before I give you the, the link to the virtual happy hour. Um, I can assign a monetary value because my entire job anymore is <laughs> only, it only involves Evergreen Indiana and Evergreen the project. And um, it's, it's so obvious to say there's no way I could not actually like look at my life the whole of my life without including Evergreen, the software, as a, a fundamental part of that. It's changed the way I thought, thought about my career. It's changed my family life. It's changed where I live. It's changed my education. It's changed all of those things. And, and it's aligned my actual personal value system so that in, to become a person that I like. So can I put a value on the transparency and trust that can accumulate in an open source community? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like me when I end up like in the ground, you can just say Evergreen did this. And I don't mean put me in the ground, but maybe at that point. <laughs> but, but everything that was in that package has some aspect of Evergreen tied into it. So. Well, it, we'll put the black and white version of the Evergreen logo on your tombstone. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Um, which, yeah. un unless you get, you know, unless you pay for a colored tombstone, but it has to be green no. to fit no, the I trademark. Would, yeah. So, and I would actually like to have Yaus on there. Uh, <laughs> so. As long as you make sure that if Rogan and I are in charge of your final arrangements, we'll make this happen for you, Ruth. You yes. make, you, y'all do whatever you need to do. I think it would be fun. I'm going to go ahead and, well, I won't be there, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to put the link for the virtual happy hour into the chat. It starts mm -hmm. at 5.15. That is going to be hosted by Bibliom Bibliomation. There are going to be some topic tables, but we're just basically going to hang out and have fun. I want to say thank you to the panelists. Um, this is this is my absolute favorite favorite topic of all in Evergreen, and I love a lot of them. But this is the thing: put get stuck in an elevator and let's talk value of Evergreen open source. I'm so sorry. Anyway, thank you to everybody. <laughs> if there are any questions that you still want to put in chat, I'm going to leave this up for another three minutes or so. And um, see y'all tomorrow or at a happy hour, happy hour. Either one. Either one. Bye. Bye. Up. Yep. Thanks, Ruth, for your hosting and your, and your enthusiasm. Yes. <laughs> no problem.